Hey, good morning, guys. What I've got for you today is the Evil Mad Scientist 741 Discrete Operational Amplifier. These are pretty cool kits. I built the uh, 555 version a few years back. So what do we have here? We have transistors, 3904, 13 pieces, and 3906, 7 pieces. I believe the 3904s are NPNs, so the 3906s are PNPs. We have a 33 picofarad ceramic capacitor, a couple of BAT85 diodes. I'm not familiar with those. Resistors, 47, 4.7K, 2 pieces, and 9 others. Mounting screws, legs. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. So let's see how, yeah, look how nice that kit is done. There's our, our legs and our knobs, but we don't need any of that. Well, I mean, we will eventually, but we don't need it right now. I would like to thank my good friend Barry in Florida for sending this out. He thought it was something I would enjoy, and he was absolutely right. Nice matte finished circuit board. All the components are labeled quite nicely. Uh-oh. Something flew out of there. Be careful. There's our resistors. There's those diodes. A couple more resistors. There's our 3904s and our 3906s. So I think for this we'll use the uh, the circuit board holder. So some of you may be saying, what is the point of this? Well, the point of this is simply to learn how discrete components make up the ICs that you're used to working with. That's a thick circuit board. Look at that. It won't, it won't fit in there exactly. Kind of got to fudge it a little bit. That's all right. So let's start by putting down some resistors. R1 is a 1K. Right there in my resistor wallet. And we will put all of our uh, tolerance marks facing up and to the right. So there's R1. Now we need R3. Well, there's another R1. We'll do that one first. Or another 1K, rather. Then here's R3 at 51K. And we'll put in R4. Which is one of the 4.7Ks. And we'll have its tolerance going to the right. Doesn't matter electric electrically, electronically. It's just 
aesthetically. So I will spread these guys out a little bit so they don't fall through the board. And we can get the soldering. Since it's a little bit colder here, I have my soldering iron up to 350. After all, it is January in Ohio. The only thing I don't like about the matte black PCBs is they, they tend to show any kind of smudge like you're going to be able to see the marks from the flux here. Other than that, I think they look pretty sweet. All right. Time for some clipping. for that pretty good all right I'm gonna go ahead and put in the rest of the resistors you don't have to watch that okay so we got all the resistors in. they went in pretty well I also went ahead and put in the single capacitor we have and the diodes diode 2 went in okay but diode 1 was giving me look at that all sorts of trouble it just doesn't want to lay flat I kept trying to get it in there and it started bending and i'm just like okay so we're just going to stop here before we break something okay we did the diodes now we need uh the transistors so i am going to start with the 3906s just because there are fewer of them one goes there. And we'll get it soldered in. Come on. There we go. So I will put in the rest of the 3906s then. All right, so we got all the uh, PNPs in the 3906s. So let's take a moment and talk about the, the 741. Probably the most widely produced op amp operational amplifier of all time it's simply a basic op amp but i mean it has some interesting things which makes it nearly foolproof it has you know overload protection on input and output there's no latch up when the common mode uh range is exceeded and it's usually free from oscillations unless of course you want it to oscillate uh, there's a high gain wide range of operating voltages it's just a really cool thing so where do they come from well we got to go way back in the way back machine the first germanium based transistor op amps appeared in 1958 and then in around 1960 they were able to use silicon nexus research lab was the first ones that did it and 1962 burr brown uh, did it now here's where things get interesting now we bring in the boys from Westinghouse um, Westinghouse Texas Instruments RCA Fairchild I'm probably missing somebody else we're all involved in this but the guy's name was H.C. Lin L-I-N remember that he was from Westinghouse and he employed on-chip component matching 
in his uh, patent for a PNT-based uh, transistor for the Minuteman missile. Then Fairchild grabbed a hold of the project and came up with the UA702 op-amp by uh, Dave Talbert and uh, Bob Widlar. That's right, Bob Widlar. And that was the first commercially used one. Then around 1965 or so, Talbert and Widler, Widlar moved to Molectro, which later became National Instruments. And uh, they created the LM101. And then in 1968, Dave Fulgar from Fairchild, Fairchild's back once again, won up the 101 by adding an internal compensating capacitor to deliver the 741. So you can see where this thing got its birth. I mean, Fairchild, Westinghouse, Texas Instruments, uh, those were some big names back in the day. So, let's move on to our last set of components. These are the uh, 3904s. And we'll get them in. Just got to make sure we've got everything facing the proper direction. As they used to say in boot camp. Attention to detail. Man, they used to hammer that in our heads. Attention to detail. In fact, when they had a, uh, a ceremony like a frocking, that is what the uh, ossifer reading the orders would begin by saying. Attention to detail. Of course, they probably don't do any of that stuff anymore. You probably get an email now. <laughs> I don't know. Well, this past weekend was the uh, NFL Conference Championships. I watched both games. I feel bad for the 49ers. Man, they just... They just had every quarterback taken away from them. Wow. So, of course, the Eagles beat them. But, I mean, that just goes to show you, not only do you need to be quite talented to win a championship game, but, you know what, the chips got to fall in your favor, too. And that happened again in the... Uh, Kansas City Cincinnati game which was a heck of a game back and forth the entire game you know it could have been anybody's game it was 2020 right about at the end uh, Kansas City was fighting for a field goal yeah, and uh, Cincinnati was just trying to stop him and when uh, Kansas City quarterback Pat Mahomes went out of bounds one of the Cincinnati Bengals guys hit him out of bounds which is an automatic 15 yard penalty putting them in field goal distance. And, of course, Harrison Butker kicked a field goal because that's what he does. And the Chiefs win, which, you know, no problem. I would much rather see the Chiefs go to the Super Bowl than the Bengals because, you know, they're in my division and, well, we don't like them. But I'm just saying, it just goes to show you, you can have all the talent and skill in the world, but things got to go in your favor, too. And that's the, the unknowable part of the universe. You can master electronics, calculus, astrophysics, chemistry. But you're still never going to understand all the mysteries of the universe. Now what I do with the rest of them transistors. <laughs> all right. Onward we go. Enough talk about football. So I got contacted by one of the uh, the major Chinese Arduino and Raspberry Pi people. 
They have a new product they wanted me to check out. It goes with the Raspberry Pi. And I'm like, sure, I'd love to check it out. By the way, uh, got any pies around? So they write me back, and they said, uh, we found two. So I offered to purchase one from them, and they agreed to that. So I've been looking for about a year for a Pi 4, and I managed to finally snag one. I've been using that Pi locator, but, man, the prices people want. Of course, you know, supply and demand. The way it works, right? <clears throat> yeah, I was seeing Pi 4Bs for going for well over $200, which is just crazy. When the original Pi's were $35. And, I mean, I understand what's going on. If you don't know, there has been a uh, bit of a Raspberry Pi shortage. It has to do with all that component shortage. And Raspberry Pi, the company, has made the smart decision on their part to prioritize their commercial and industrial customers, people who have built their, their businesses on using the Raspberry Pi. So Pi has been uh, prioritizing them as opposed to the hobbyist. Which, you know, can't blame them. These companies, like I said, built their business on a Raspberry Pi. And then if they can't get any, well, they're out of business. Whereas you and I, we can hang out a little bit and uh, just get a Pi when they become available. And according to the Raspberry Pi Foundation, they hope to have pies back in the store. I think they're saying third quarter this year, which means probably add two quarters to that. So maybe second quarter of 2024 before they'll be, you know, readily available again. That's just experience on my part of dealing with large supply chains. They say third quarter this year. That means we'll probably get some out in the third quarter. More in the fourth quarter than more in the uh, first quarter of next year and then by the second quarter. So summertime 2024, we should be pretty good. In the meantime, if you absolutely have to have one, well, they are out there. If I can remember, I'll put a link to the uh, Pi locator down below. All right, time for some clipping. Okay, now we will put on the legs. She got legs. <laughs> Yeah, I don't sing. Well, I, I, I do, but I don't do it in public because I'm not very good at it. That's going to need a bigger screwdriver. One moment. Yeah, these are, these are a little tight, so I need a screwdriver with a little more meat on them. Oh heck, was I supposed to put... Yeah, crap. Attention to detail, right? I was not paying attention to detail. I mean, these things aren't even tapped. That's why it's so hard to get them in there. I'll do this one first. 
on its own. Still not the right size screwdriver. All right, so screw thing leg. So far, so good. Screw washer. Leg okay, screw this one may be more difficult to get the washer on. Let's see, what we'll do is we'll slide. The washer into place. And then hold it there. And get our screw in. Come on. There we go. Now I just have to screw them all in. Alrighty. We've got everything in place. Let's see if we can make it work. So output. To the inverting input. Is going to go through. A feedback resistor. which is 470k <laughs> get all these things on here this is going to be funny there's our 470k feedback resistor I'm sorry 470R and here is a 220 input resistor now we just need to get all these things on here. Yeah, see, I don't like that. Gonna do this better. Get you on there like that. Get you on there like that. All right, now we're solid. Now we're solid. Then we're gonna put in our input like show. Then we need to connect up some grounds over here. Ground there. Ground there. Ground there. Then we can connect up our VCC over here. And we're pulling four. New four milliamps. Let's go up to the scope. <clears throat> Connect up my grounds. Okay, here is our input signal. Interesting, why are you doing that? Hmm. 
Oh, because it's not on. Here we go. Okay. All right, there we go. So there is our input signal. It's at 10 kilohertz, and we are looking at about 13 volts peak to peak. Now let's move it over to the output. Huh. Let's try this again. There's our input. Oh, you know what? I'm going to turn down the, uh, the amplitude here. Let's try this. On a set. There we go. So I'm putting in four volts peak to peak. There's our four volts. And then let's see what our output looks like. Remember four volts in. And we're getting almost eight volts out. So, it works. Very cool. I'm going to have some fun with this. That is a conglomeration of ground points right there. So, I would like to thank Barry once again for sending this out. I'd like to thank you guys for watching and uh, being a part of our little community here. If you enjoyed this, I hope you'll give me a thumbs up. Feel free to comment, share, and don't forget to subscribe. Big thanks to all the patrons. Big thanks to you for watching. That's it. I'm out. Peace.